Ice Ice Baby, teaching advanced secondary school students about biological ice nucleation in the global water cycle. My name is Renee Peach and I am a PhD candidate working in the Schmali lab at Virginia Tech. We're going to start with story time. Once upon a time, in 1964, in the state of Wisconsin, there was a problem called the northern corn leaf blight. This was a disease of infecting corn that was caused by a fungus. A common way of dealing with a plant disease such as this was to find a strain of corn that was resistant to the fungus. This research group in Wisconsin set about to use this method to find a strain of corn that was resistant to the northern corn leaf blight. The method of doing this involved taking leaves that were infected with the northern corn leaf blight, drying them, grinding them into a powder, and then putting that powder from the infected leaves onto healthy corn plants. And if the healthy corn plants did not become infected, then that strain of corn was resistant and they could plant that strain of corn everywhere. So they used this method. They put infected corn leaf powder onto healthy corn plants. This is called inoculating, putting the powder onto the healthy plants. Unfortunately, a frost that was unexpected happened and they were very devastated to go out and see that their corn plants were frost damaged and their experiment wasn't going to work. So to clarify, frost damage is caused when temperatures go below freezing and water inside of the plant cells freezes, which causes crystals, ice crystals to form, and those crystals expand against the cell wall and cause the cell wall to burst, and that's the source of damage from frost. And that happens instantly after the plants freeze. Now the northern corn leaf blight was a disease caused by a fungus, and the symptoms from that disease would take several days to show up. So they were trying to find a strain resistant to the northern corn leaf blight, but this frost damage interrupted their experiment. However, they noticed something very interesting about the frost damage, and that ended up being what they pursued, and they put the northern corn leaf blight on the back burner. They noticed that when they took the infected powder and put it onto plants, the frost damage happened. But plants that were not inoculated with the infected corn powder weren't damaged by the frost. And they started to wonder about this. Was there something in the infected corn leaf powder that was causing frost damage? This became the focus of their research. And they started to do all kinds of experiments to determine what it could be in the corn leaf powder that was infected by the northern corn leaf blight that caused frost damage. One thing they noticed was that samples that were turbid, that means they were cloudy looking, those samples tended to cause increased frost damage. And this turbid, turbidity or this cloudiness is a sign of microbial activity. And so they started to think maybe there was some type of microbial activity in this infected corn leaf powder that was causing frost damage. So we're going to leave this story for right now. We're going to come back to it. But right now, I'm going to let you ponder what it could be in the infected corn leaf powder. What could be the agent within that powder that is causing increased frost damage on the corn plants? I'd like you to see a demonstration of the type of freezing that was observed by the Wisconsin group. 100 milliliters of pure water is put into a bottle, which is then put into a cooling bath that is set at negative 8 degrees Celsius. After 20 minutes, which allows enough time for the water to reach negative 8 degrees, 4 milliliters of water is added, and the bottle is swished. And you can see that the water remains liquid. No freezing occurs even though that water was negative 8 degrees Celsius, pure water. Then we take the same bottle and add 4 milliliters of the infected corn leaf powder. That's added and the bottle is swish, just as before when the pure water was added. But this time you can see that freezing occurs instantly. You can see how the ice crystals form and the whole bottle freezes. In the demonstration that you just saw, was there anything surprising or unexpected to you? Were you surprised to see that water remained liquid at negative 8 degrees Celsius? 
If most of us were asked at what temperature does water freeze, we would say 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. However, this is not exactly true. Water is actually liquid down to negative 38 degrees Celsius. If it is very pure and can be supercooled, it will remain liquid down to these very cold temperatures. Now this is the condition of water up in the atmosphere where clouds form. It is free of all impurities and is in a supercooled state. However, we know that water freezes in clouds at temperatures about negative 3 to negative 5 degrees Celsius. So how does this happen? The answer is an ice nucleus, which is a particle that catalyzes water molecules to begin the crystal formation necessary for ice. So below negative 38 degrees Celsius, we can have pure water in liquid supercooled state that will form ice. And this is called homogeneous freezing. However, at temperatures above negative 38 degrees Celsius, an ice nucleus, a particle, is necessary. And this particle must have the ability to start assembling the liquid water molecules in the right shape to form the crystal lattice for ice. And this is called heterogeneous freezing. And so we can uh, use an ice nucleation assay to determine if different particles can serve as ice nuclei and at what temperature. So this is an example. We have a water bath that can cool down to negative 8 in this example. And then we can test different particles suspended in water and see if they freeze or not. So on the bottom of this little yellow diagram, this yellow picture, we have pure water, no ice nuclei, and at negative 8, those drops are liquid. Now the row above, those drops of water have an ice nucleus in them, and that causes them to freeze at negative 8 degrees Celsius. So in clouds, we have some type of ice nuclei that are up in the atmosphere, and we have the pure, super cool water and the ice nuclei particles are lead to heterogeneous freezing, and we get ice formation at temperatures about negative 5 or even a couple degrees warmer, and that's how we get cloud formation. We're going to go back to story time. This time it's once upon a time in Wyoming, about the same time as the Wisconsin story, 1960s. Now this group in Wyoming, they knew that Clouds formed with ice nuclei, what I just talked about in the last couple of slides. They knew about that. And it was commonly thought that these ice nuclei particles were some type of dust or mineral. However, dust or mineral, any type of dust or mineral that had been tested, the very warmest that it would serve as an ice nucleus and cause freezing was negative 5 degrees Celsius. But as I mentioned a little earlier, we know that clouds can form about negative 3. So they were on a search to find what the ice nuclei were that would cause freezing a couple degrees warmer, about negative three degrees. And they tested a variety of different substances, all kinds of things. One of the things they tested was some very dirty looking snow. And it was very unexpected and surprising to them that this was one of the very best ice nucleus that they found. It served as warmer temperatures and caused some of the, was one of the best freezing agents. So they tested a variety of different substances and they began to see a pattern. Clay substrate was one of the worst ice nucleators that they tested, but organic soil surface was one of the best. It had leaves and different organic matter and it was one of the best freezing agents and it was at one of the warmest temperatures. So on a spectrum, they saw that volcanic ash was at the lowest end of being a poor ice nucleator, had no microbial activity, but peak, which is a very organic, rich material um, in soil, that was one of the best ice nucleators, the warmest temperatures, had very high ice nucleation activity. So now we can see how these two stories are beginning to merge together. The Wyoming group found that peat was their best ice nucleator, had the best freezing ability. And the Wisconsin group found that the turbid samples caused the most frost damage, so were the best freezing agent. So in both of these, 
peat and turbid samples, they both are indications that there's a lot of microbial activity happening. So both groups started to narrow in that there was something microbial that was a cause of the freezing that they were studying. So they continued to narrow in on that and explore the possibility of something microbial. And what they found was it's a bacterium, Pseudomonas stringi, that causes water to freeze at higher temperatures. In both cases, this bacterium was the cause. So how does a bacterium cause freezing? There's a nice nucleation protein that is expressed on the cell surface. This protein is able to grab liquid water molecules and help them to assemble into the right pattern to form a crystal lattice, which is necessary in ice formation. Pseudomonas stringi is one of the warmest, if not the very warmest, ice nucleators known, with the ability to freeze water as warm as negative 2 degrees Celsius. So we talked about frost damage in the beginning, and Pseudomonas stringi is able to increase frost damage by causing those water molecules to freeze at warmer temperatures, and the freezing damages the cell walls, and so at warmer temperatures, frost damage is increased. Pseudomonas stringi can be a plant pathogen, and so as a pathogen, it can be an advantage to increase frost damage because that damage allows the pathogen to enter into the cells and into the um, leaf. Now there's human uses of Pseudomonas stringi. One of them is making artificial snow. There's dead inert uh, Pseudomonas stringi that's used in a brand called Snowmax, and it is commonly used in snow resorts for skiing to make artificial snow. So next time you're on vacation and skiing down a mountain, you can think about all the bacteria that are helping to make your vacation possible. Frozen food is another application of Pseudomonas stringi. In order to properly freeze food without causing damage to it, it must be frozen at temperatures as cold as negative 40 degrees Celsius, and this is very expensive to generate temperatures that cold. But with Pseudomonas stringi, freezing can occur at warmer temperatures and have the same quality of frozen food and thereby be more cost effective. So what do we know about the life history of Pseudomonas stringi? We know that it is found basically everywhere. On this diagram illustrated by number one, we know that it's found in clouds and in rain. Number two shows it can be found in snow. Uh, three, it's found on plants and grass. Uh, four, we know it's found in subsurface water. We know it's found in lakes and streams, rivers, and also in biofilms illustrated by number five and six. Number seven shows it can be found in irrigation water. Uh, number eight, it aerosolizes from water and plants. And number nine, it's even found in the water table. So it appears that Pseudomonas stringi is found everywhere, particularly in all parts of the water cycle, and it is likely moving with the water throughout the water cycle. So let's think about a question. Can bacteria make it rain? Looking at this picture with the bacteria Pseudomonas stringi, depicted by the little red dots seen on the right on the tree. We know it's found on plant surfaces. We know it can aerosolize and go all the way to the atmosphere. Using the ice nucleation ability, it can form clouds, and those can be rain-producing clouds. The Pseudomonas stringi can return to Earth in rain, and we have sampled it in rain. It can be found in rain. And then deposit back onto vegetative surfaces um, on Earth. Now, because rain was caused, this would increase plant growth and make greater habitat for the bacteria to dwell. So this could be a positive feedback cycle where the bacteria is increasing the cycle, which provides it with increased habitat and a way to move and um, deposit in new places. How do we know about weather? Usually we listen to a meteorologist on the news who describes the weather that we're going to experience based on 
different uh, air currents and pressure systems, but do we ever think that bacteria might be responsible for causing some of that weather? We've talked a lot about Pseudomonas stringi as an ice nucleator, but there are a variety of ice nucleators that are known. Um, lichen, fungus, algae, pollen, bacteria. Now, certainly not every organism within these categories, but within each of these categories, there are some known ice nucleators and inorganic ice nucleators as well. Silver iodide is commonly used in cloud seeding and feldspar is another well-known inorganic ice nucleator and there are others. Ice nucleation research involves a variety of different scales going all the way down to molecular scale. There's interest in looking at the ice nucleation protein that Pseudomonas stringi expresses and how does that work and all the way up to a global scale if we think about weather patterns and movement and deposition in the atmosphere. Uh, there's a lot of interest thinking about ice nucleation at a global scale. And a variety of different disciplines have an interest in ice nucleation research. We think about molecular biology or biochemistry or chemistry looking at the ice nucleation protein and the expression and how does that work. Um, microbiology certainly applies to studying bacteria. Um, plant pathology is interested in Pseudomonas stringi as a plant pathogen. Farmers would have an interest in the plant pathogen aspect as well as in um, weather implications. Meteorology and atmospheric science would be interested in the more global scale um, weather patterns. Ecology is involved. Um, environmental engineering. Modeling is a good way to study movement and effects of bacteria moving in the atmosphere at more large scales than are usually researched in a lab setting. So you can see that ice nucleation is a prime example of interdisciplinary research. I hope that this unit had you think about some new concepts as well as to think in new ways about concepts you already knew. I think ice nucleation is a fascinating topic with many interesting applications, and I hope that you are intrigued by it as well.